So hello, everybody. Let's get going. Uh, we have a bunch of people who are on Zoom. Some of them are in different time zones, including Europe. And so I want to be respectful of people who stay up uh, after midnight to be able to hear Carl and see some of his cool stuff. On behalf of the Center Gallery, I'm Glenn Nelson. I'm the manager of the space. And it's going to be so much fun tonight. It's a big celebration. I don't know if you're all aware, but uh, I suspect you, since you're here, you are. That today is the 100th anniversary to the day of the publication of Ulysses. It was published on James Joyce's own birthday, so it's also his birthday, 140 years uh, young and, and moving forward. So Carl and I have never met until a month ago, six weeks ago. Okay, November, first week of November. And I we think. have mutual friends. Uh, Linda Danes was in the room here, introduced us. And so I went to his house and I saw all these completely cool artwork. There were sculptures, there were drawings, there were assemblages, there were lots of masks and wild and crazy things. And out of the corner of my eye, I noticed there was all this stuff about James Joyce. And I said, what is that about? And it turns out we have this big mutual affection for Joyce. Um, and so knowing that this anniversary of uh, Ulysses and Joyce's birthday was coming up, I said, how about if we just prepare some comments and and then, uh, as you'll as you'll find out, Carl really ran with that and uh, has created a whole bunch of work. And so our goal today is to talk about Carl, to talk about this work, and to have uh, you all, if you want to ask questions, those of you who are on on our Zoom call, you can write in <coughs> questions into our chat. And at the end of the evening, we're going to get to a whole bunch of those. So let me get kind of official and read uh, Carl's uh, bio. Although I don't know how sincere you were when you were writing this, it seems a little. I'm never sincere. It seems a little cheeky. Sincere is not my. Uh, you don't do sincere. I don't do sincere. Well, I do sincere. Okay. Harrington is something of a pioneer in Joyce portraiture, creating his first James Joyce as a porcelain bust in 1979. In the 41 years since, he's created an archive of dozens of cartoons, drawings, paintings, and sculptures through the years. How many drawings have you made? Would you guess? So several hundred, yeah. I would say, several hundred. Yeah, you were underplaying it here. Several hundred we're going on for. And for a while, Carl ran a James Joyce-ish webzine called The Haunted Ink Bottle. You'll hear all about that tonight. Over the years, he lectured at the James Joyce Society when it met at the legendary Gotham Book Mart, Rest in Peace, Where yeah. Wise Men Fish. Yeah. A portrait of Joyce by Carl was chosen as a cover image for James Joyce's A Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, a case study published by Oxford University Press in 2003. Carl spent most of his career as a celebrity journalist covering music, and you'll hear about that tonight if that's new to you. He says, chasing, one, chasing all the one name stars, Mick, Madonna, Sly, Tina, Mariah, Patti Smith, Kurt Vonnegut, Pope John XXIII, he actually held a moon rock that belonged to Carrie Fisher. Is that your greatest success? Uh, well, it was it was up there. It was it was way out, as it were. Yes. Now yeah. he mostly makes uh, retire. Now he's mostly retired and makes art and writes, and uh, and is the most wonderful, charming person that you'll ever have the pleasure oh. to meet. Well, maybe there's well, someone I hope, else. I hope that's not true. I don't uh, know. I can't think of who it would be though. Yeah. Like, it's way up there. Um, so, please welcome. Okay. Uh, so as an overview of the evening, let's yeah. give an overview of the yeah, evening. Yeah. So what I would like to know is how Carl got involved with all this stuff, what this connection with Joyce was, what attracted to him to Joyce, all of the sort of things that we've kind of been talking about yeah. over time a little bit. And then, um, and then we're going to move over and talk about the actual artworks. And with Joyce, as you know, if you've read Joyce, any given path can lead to millions of other paths. So every once in a while, I might be in the, I might have the job of um, interrupting and saying, oh, wait, I want to know a little bit more about this sort of thing. And if you all are in the same camp, uh, you can do that as well. So, so why don't you tell us how it all got started for you? All? <laughs> right. Uh, well, you're not going to be one of those. Were you that bad of it? Were you a mean interviewer? In your day? No, I was really nice. I they didn't even know that they'd been interviewed until they saw the cover story and then went, ah, oh no, what did I say? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I think the the my my interest in Joyce, I was 
really probably first introduced to Joyce when I was in college. I probably had a literature class where they had us read some of his short stories and they meant nothing to me. Nothing happened in the story, totally bored, didn't make any impression on me at all. Uh, and so I went in a, in a different direction uh, and it probably, I, you know, the fact that I have now made, you know, hundreds of drawings and sculptures of this obscure Irish writer uh, is eccentric probably to the point of being bizarre for what I've done in my life, because um, I spent most of my life as a celebrity journalist. If any of you ever saw, um, uh, uh, what was the Cameron Crowe movie? Almost Famous. If you ever saw the movie Almost Famous, that was my life, you know. Um, but I- What publications did you work for? Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the rundown of how I got into it all. I, um, I after I, gra I graduated from, I grew up in Logan, Utah. I graduated in journalism and political science and went to Detroit to work for a travel magazine called Friends Magazine that was put out by Chevrolet. And then one weekend when I was living there in 1975, I said, oh, there's an Elton John concert. I'd really like to go to the Elton John concert, but I had no idea there were no tickets. So I told a little fib, I said, I called up the Detroit Free Press and said, oh, I have this great Elton John interview that I'm going to do. Uh, and then I called up Elton John's publicist and said, I have an assignment from the Detroit Free Press. And so what was a lie became the truth eventually. So that's uh, my, my, uh, my career started with um, writing a story about Elton John that was in the Roto-Gravura of the Sunday Detroit Free Press. And they liked it enough that they then uh, hired me as their rock critic. And so I worked for the Detroit Free Press for uh, about two years and got to you know, meet all these fabulous people, James Brown, and got to hear songs in the key of life, the first time it was ever played in the world, up in Worcester, Massachusetts uh, with Stevie Wonder. Um, and that became my life. And it, it, it's bizarre, bizarre because I'm not a musician. I, re <laughs> I really don't, I don't play any instrument. If you heard me sing, you would ask me to stop. It's really, uh, it, it was a kind of, but I, what, what I do understand is people. I knew how to talk to people. Uh, and so I ended up being, I think, a pretty good journalist and work and learn to work on deadline. But I had been a, a, a writer from the time I was in ninth grade. I published my first, uh, I was wrote a little sports show for the junior high newspaper. And my next big step was that I was expelled from junior high for publishing an underground newspaper in junior high that had the audacity to print all the middle names of all of the teachers. That was that was our big get is that we had the middle. Can't even shut her off from my iPad. That were there, uh, so that was that was fun, and uh, they kind of let the ex expulsion go because they didn't want to have me around for another year. The ninth grade by that time, and they said, "You take you have him. You take care of him." But then after Detroit, you were what? What cities and publications did you work for? So then, that, so I worked. Uh, so in Detroit, I went to work for the Free Press. I worked for them for about three years. Then I moved to New York, and I moved and I worked for the for the New York Post as their rock critic and spent a couple of years working for Murdoch and the New York Post there. And the next thing I did after that, was I, I edited a heavy metal magazine called Circus Magazine. 
And then that's where I met Ozzy Osbourne and had the pleasure of saving his life by diving into the fountain at uh, Caesar's palace while he was drunk and dragging him out and saving his life. That was not on the resume here. Well, it's, that that's the usual. <laughs> I don't dare put that stuff up. Um, but I, I basically got to just do a lot of fun stuff. You know, when, when people and then uh, after I was at circus, then I went to work for people and I was their rock writer and started writing cover stories on, you know, Carly Simon and Michael Jackson and, uh, you know, Pat Benatar and Ozzy Osbourne and, uh, you know, anybody that uh, was famous. I was the music editor. And you broke the yeah. Tina and Ike story. And I did break the Tina and I, I don't know exactly, I know why uh, Tina's, Tina's manager that, that, that kind of helped rescue her, Roger Davies, was the manager of also uh, Olivia Newton-John. And I had done a cover story on Olivia Newton-John and it, when she had that uh, album physical, let's get physical, she had the, you know, the, the whatever, I don't, what did she have, like a little scarf or something? There was something that she had that started. Anyway, he liked me a lot and said, Tina, if you want to have a career, you need to have some publicity. So he invited me over. Tina really liked me. And she basically told me the story of her being an abused spouse. And it was the first time she had ever talked about it in public. And this was 1981. And this was at a time where people did not talk about that sort of thing. Yeah. So it was a huge story. And, uh, you know, the world found out. And as a result of that, she got a big recording contract. And Tina of Ike and Tina then became Tina yeah. that the world has. Now, um, this isn't a world away from Joyce because Joyce has a connection with music and we'll get to that in a second. Yeah. But why don't you come now bring us up to date with how Joyce came into your life and how that it became something that you wanted to okay, so, build and create things. Like. Uh, all right. So the first, uh, the, the first Joyce piece that I made, I was taking a pottery class up at the Riverside Church when William Sloan Coffin was up there. And I was taking, uh, they had a, 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 a kiln there you know, up on the, I don't know, fifth floor or something like that. And I chose to uh, work in, um, in um, porcelain. And I decided to do, I did a series of, uh, of caricatures of authors that I like. This is David Levine version of this. So you can see where my inspiration came from in that. Uh, and this was a little, I also did portraits of uh, Boris Pasternak and Virginia Woolf and Colette and uh, Brezhnev and John Kenneth Galbraith. Anyway, I did a whole bunch of clay work. So this is the, and I just, I chose Joyce because I was fascinated with the way he looked. I don't know what it was <laughs> about him, whether he, what, 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 was the, what was the thing about that look that particularly appealed to me in 1979. Made a good sculpture, for one thing. I loved the drawing of it. Um, and then I, you know, I, 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 I didn't wear glasses, but when I did have a chance to wear glasses, well, you know, uh, I, I began to look more and more like him. I guess I need a little bit of a mustache. But um, so I became fascinated with him just as a persona. But then I continued on just doing my, you know, Tina and Bob Seger and The Who and Mick Jagger and all of that stuff. Uh, and didn't really do too much with art because for then for uh, 15 years, 700 weeks, I was writing, you know, sometimes two or three articles a week on deadline. And uh, sometimes I would be at the New York Post pounding away at something. And this is like at 1130 at night. And there was a copy boy right next to me as I was typing. And as each 
page came out of the typewriter, he would take it down to the composing room and they would put it on the press to catch the morning edition. I was surprised when we were talking that you came to Joyce in a way, not through the fiction, but through his, the Richard Elman biography. That's right. So there must be something about him as a person yeah. that really was attractive to yeah. you. I think uh, most people didn't go to Joyce that way. Right. But I did. Oh, you did. You, yeah. read, you just started reading. So yeah, the, this Richard Elman biography yeah. is really extraordinary. It was written in the mid fifties. And, um, and it was just so much about his life that I, it was a world away from anything that I knew, but I completely right. identified with him. Right. So why don't you talk a little bit about like what, yeah. what is it as a person that uh, attracted you? Okay, to this, this is the book that I, I wonder, I was living in, I had gone to uh, live in London for uh, a couple of years. Uh, my wife had a job uh, in London and I took a kind of sabbatical. I hadn't had you know, a week off in 15 years and was exhausted and uh, at, at kind of at loose ends. And uh, when I got there, I went to a, a used bookstore and I ran across this book and I thought, well, Oh, oh, take a look at this. Yeah. So I started reading the book and I just kind of fell into his life. Uh, the detail, it's considered one of the great literary biographies ever written. And the details about his life and his Irishness and his stubbornness and his, uh, his ability to use words beyond what I could even conceive of at that point, but I was fascinated by, it was like a very long, you know, People Magazine article about every ah, little detail of his thing. life. Uh, you know, he was, uh, uh, he was, he was angry, he was persnickety, he was a difficult young man, he was the oldest of 10 children, he was the most brilliant person in his school, his father was kind of a wastrel, didn't support the family and was an alcoholic. And, but he kept winning all of these prizes and the prize money would help support the family along the way. So it was really the, the, his, his life experience. I knew what life experience was. I knew what a fascinating person was. And because, it, uh, because I didn't have a deadline, in front of me. I didn't have to finish all of this stuff and then move on to the next one. When I was at People Magazine, it was essentially being infatuated with a new person every week. I would be completely enveloped with whoever it was that I was writing about at that time. If it was Stevie Wonder, I was all about Stevie Wonder for that week. And the week after it was somebody else. When I got to London, I didn't have a deadline. And I decided well, one of the things I wanted to do in London was to go to art school. So I enrolled at the Chelsea Art School and uh, I had to choose a subject for things to uh, paint and make art about. And the subject I chose was uh, was James um, Joyce. When you were in London, did you feel a little bit like an expatriate? Did that connect you? Because Joyce was famously left Ireland, never came back yeah. and wrote about nothing else but Ireland. Right. Well, I, I grew up in Utah. If you look at my, you know, I, grew, I was born in Logan, Utah. I graduated from Logan High School. I graduated from Utah State University. But uh, along the way, uh, l like Joyce and his children, I moved a lot, our family, uh, when I was six months old, I was taken to North Carolina to live for a year while my dad worked on his PhD there. And he was? And he was, my dad is Leonard Arrington, who is a prominent Mormon historian, the father of Mormon history, one might say. And he, uh, so he took, he was at the University of North Carolina, came back to Logan. Then in when we were in, when I was in second grade, he decided, oh, I'll get a Fulbright fellowship to uh, go teach in Italy. So our family moved to Italy and lo and behold, my parents just dropped us off at an Italian public school <laughs> with no language, 
No one there spoke any English. I spoke no Italian. And it was a traumatic experience. But this is again, one of the having, having some living experience in Italy in 1957, there's another thing I share with Joyce. He spent a lot of his life living in Italian. And in fact, Italian was the family language for their family. And uh, so um, after, then we came back to Logan. And then again, when, uh, uh, let's see, before that, when, I was in, when we were in kindergarten, he went to Pasadena. We moved to Pasadena then moved back to Logan, then moved to Italy, then moved back to Logan. When I was a sophomore in high school, then we moved to Pacific Palisades in uh, Los Angeles uh, in 1966. And I'll, this will explain what our high school was like. The doors played oh, at our school. What? He's making it all about himself. Yeah. That was the kind of school that it was. It was kind of ground zero for the drug culture, the music culture. Uh, you know, it's where rich people, extremely rich people live now. But I went to Pally High. It would be like dropping, you know, a beaver cleaver uh, down in the middle of Woodstock. That was kind of uh, the way of my experience there. I was completely uh, flabbergasted by everything because I'd grown up in this little town and all of a sudden there were all these vans that were had you know fumes of pot spraying out of it and people had long hair and they painted themselves and it was it was a pretty wild time 1966 1967 this was sort of ground zero what about you as a writer I you know, after all of this music, yeah. had you done experimental writing? Did that side of Joyce appeal to it you? It did, it did, it did appeal to me, and I learned how he did it, how he wrote and how he wrote in layers. I, I have to confess that I, I because I'm not a, a Joyce scholar, I'm not interested in necessarily in the literature of Joyce. I'm interested well, in you're his not life. interested in it. No, I'm not uninterested, in it, but I learned how he did it. And he would write, you know, the dog goes down the street, but then he would go back to that sentence 20 times and then make a paragraph out of it. it would have all kinds of literary allusions in it. And by the time he got to writing Finnegan's Wake at the end of his life, he was just making up all the words. There are no real words in it. They're all compounded words that he made up. So to be able to do it, there are 40 different languages that are used to make compound words in Finnegan's way. So I was interested in the way he did it because I, for one thing, my language skills were not good. In Italy, I had language trauma. I couldn't, uh, I, I couldn't speak very well. We didn't speak that way at, at, uh, at the school that I went to. And, uh, and, and so I was grateful to come back to English. When I went as a missionary to Bolivia, I spoke Spanish, but again, I just don't have that facility. I don't have a very good left side, which is probably also the reason why I can't play any music. I'm a kind of a right brain kind of person, but I was fascinated by the way he wrote and he wrote in layers so that he would take something and then he would go in and put a whole bunch of his jokes in them, personal jokes, literary allusions, so that if you could read it on multiple levels, you know, the dog went down the street or there might be, you know, four phrases of Latin that he put into it. So I tried. Uh, writing some things uh, Prove it. as 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 a as a Joycean. Well, I'll I'll use an example of uh, this is a first. I'll read the this is a this is a, a a dream that I had. This is just a straight dream. I came upon a group of people gathered on the back street of a large city at what looked like a large rally. There were perhaps several hundred people. Some of them were naked. On the platform, something like a float trailer, was a man and a woman with large, clear balloons fastened to their wrists with string. The people were quite excited with anticipation. Then suddenly the man and woman began rising into the sky. 
They lifted off and they went higher and higher. And we watched them against the dark skyline. The woman disappeared, but we could see the man. He was fairly young, clean shaven, with light brown hair. As the man reached the top of the skyline, he went near a building and drifted into the window. Somehow, the rest of the crowd appeared in the window and we could see inside the building where the man was. As we looked, we could see that now the balloon had disappeared or surrounded the man and how he was glowing. He was running down the long hallway with the wall at the end. And as he approached the wall, the wall opened entirely and the crowd began running after him. About all we could see in the distance was the glow and catch the face occasionally as he looked back over his smiling shoulder. And then at the end, it says, I'm not sure how these events, I, I, one of the things that I did uh, along the way is that I had a drawing. Uh, one of the person on the uh, left is me and the person on the right is James Joyce. So this would have been a, I started keeping a dream journal and that's where this dream comes from. And this was uh, one of the drawings from it. So I took this dream and decided, well, I'll just go all James Joyce on it. So this is the exact same text that I was just reading to you that I've gone all Joyce on. Icky came upon a chosen tribe of purple peeping proles, all blather gathered on the black strap strip of a macropolis lip sinking in the Claridian city of salt shattering Joyce to the world. What looked like a surging frothing corpus rude rally gathered round the flagging facts, the conjugal protocol, diverse, thou art, thou ist. Perhaps several hundred placable people were bucked, secret, named, birthday suited, and staring out with such looks of double-jointed expectation. Come, come, ye ain'ts. Flurry they surround the skirty flirted platform, where the swarthy moorman and snowy Liza woman had semi-scopular, large globular, cleary sphered ball buffoons fastened and testimonied to their link wrists with string quartets. The tribal pupas were quake excited with anticipation. Suddenly, the fellow traveler and his sister began rising heliumtropish into the skyline by line, rooftop upon precept. They lifted off, floating higher and cooler and lighter. Not just a tithe, but a full tide wafted them hither and thither as Icky scoped them against the dusty expanse of the cricket-free landscape. That's, that's a paragraph that I've done my best to, you know. Uh, it, 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 and if you're following it, like the wordplay, you know, you hear one thing and you're kind of figuring out what it might be, but visually it's this whole other thing too which is what Joyce is so amazing at. Now we're going to run into a time constraints. Okay. Should we, what should we go talk about the art? Sure. Let's go, have... sure, let's go ahead talk about the art. Uh, I mean, one of the, 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 the things that fascinated with, with uh, me about Joyce for one thing were his medical problems. This is the, it, from the index of the Elman book. And this is his, just the index pages that have to do with his eye problems. He had 14 different uh, eye surgeries for irisitis, which basically left him blind for the last 15 years of his life. He had to walk with a cane uh, because of the eyes. He had to have all of his teeth removed at one time and yet he continued to write for five hours a day and then somebody would carry him over to the bar and he would spend the rest of the night carousing with his friends getting drunk so he he was kind of a man of iron but also very fragile and um it took him 
17 years to write Finnegan's Way. And the way he wrote it was he was, uh, he, he was dictating it to none other than Samuel Beckett was his secretary. So anyway, um, I'll go talk about the picture. Right, cool. And so we're going to slide this around so people can see what, what you're talking about. Where is the time? You're, you're doing fantastic. You don't have to worry about time. Okay, so uh, where do you get? Um, the first thing I did were drawings after this. This is the first I did. These were done in Menlo Park. This was kind of a little joke. Is the, this is James Joyce is the, the letterman for Ireland High. This is kind of a joke. And, and the next one was him as an old man. And I just thought of him as a kind of human brain that I wanted to do. And I clearly wasn't right doing anything from photographs. I was just doing this from my own imagination. I'm uh, doing it in Menlo Park. Uh, and down here begins where I'm in art school. Uh, and so I did a whole series of portraits of him in different mediums, uh, acrylics. This is the uh, drawing that became the cover of the uh, portrait artist as a young man book that was studying. This is an acrylic drawing that uh, is kind of the essence of Joyce to me. Getting drunk on wine, singing out. He was a great singer. He had a great tenor voice. At a certain point, he actually considered having a professional um, career as a singer. So he would go to these places. He would be silent all week, and he would go to these places and would get up on the piano and sing for everybody there. So that was one of my essential things. Uh, here's him after, uh, based on a photograph, after one of his eye operations. His left eye was mostly left blind. You could see a little bit out of the right eye. Uh, and I put the, the, the little orange shape there is eye And I, when uh, I gave a talk on uh, this to the James Joyce Society, one of the uh, Great grandchildren of James Joyce was there and was very angry that I had put orange in, into this was that in the middle of the troubles. So he was very angry that I had put the orange in instead of the green. Uh, this is a series that I did of um, you know, this particular caricature of him, in which I just uh, had a piece of vellum that I had a, a design of. And then these variations of, uh, of, of that, so I could get different moods. Uh, some of them are done with, uh, with uh, pastels, some with uh, aqua color pencils. Uh, this one uh, is probably all done with pencil and I've been washed over. Just like. Uh, so each of these was then a project. You have to take something and spend it. A week and turn in something at the end. Uh, these are from drawing books. Uh, this was a little tiny uh, pencil drawing, but then I used later went in with computers and put added color to it. Uh, this was just how many how 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 few lines can you use to evoke a person? And so that was kind of the exercise of like. Who, who is this? Uh, based on the rest of it, you might be able to guess that that was who it was. Uh, this was one where I was trying to, you know, if you're going to do more like a, a you know, break it up into planes, uh, do it with that. Uh, pen and ink drawing that has all of Joyce's books behind him. Uh, this one was, I. Yeah. I decided I was going to make a whole, an entire studio uh, sketchbook of just people that I knew drawing wow. as fast as the pen never rose from the paper. And I did it just as fast as I could do it. I could think of the person. So I have a, an entire sketchbook that has different people. And this is my joy. He always, if I, if I did a group of things, he was, I would do a self portrait and then I would do one of choice. Uh, 
uh, again, this is that kind of minimals kind of how, how little can you get, can you use to, uh, to evoke the person. Uh, this was a more careful pen and ink drawing and, and you, I don't know that you can see it from here, but there are all each of this, there's about 20 pairs of little tiny eyes in that. So that was somehow I wanted to evoke this kind of internal narrative that was going on. He, one of the things that he was famous for was the uncertain narr narrator. You don't know who is talking. And he had an amazing memory. That's one of the things that I don't have is a good memory. I have a very Swiss cheesy memory. But he remembered everything. And, they, and he carried around a little notebook with him in his back pocket. And then he would hear some phrase of somebody on the street. He would get this out, write this down in it. And then he would take these all and put them into his books. So he used street slang and picked up things in that way. Uh, uh, this one is a kind of my sort of James Joyce and John Lennon uh, kind of thing. I, I, I'm not exactly sure you know, how it came to it. kind of half John Lennon, half Jesus kind of picture of him. This is the, um, let's see, let me. Many on Zoom from other parts of the world, Tony wrote. After Joyce died in 1941, they made a death mask of his face. He died of a duodenal ulcer, January 13th, 1941. So they put a plaster over uh, his face and made this death mask of it. So I decided that I would do a series of paintings, uh, <coughs> drawings. Uh, this is the death mask in color. And this is sort of my idea of Joyce in the Bardo. This is after he's, you know, in the, in the days after he's died. Where do, where do you go after you die? According to the Tibetan, you, you Tibetan Buddhists, you go to the Bardo, which is sort of this limbo in between kind of place. So this is, this is Joyce in the Bardo. So I have a question that yeah. other people might be asking. Yeah. One or two. Yeah. Why did you make all of them? So like some people are making art for, you know, for commercial purposes, some are, are, are for a project. You seem to just have been doing it some it's, kind I don't of know, reason you know, why. I guess it's like a Beatlemania. It just was something that caught hold of me. And it was a personality who was so complex and so dense that every time I let go of it, if I would go back to it, I would find something new. I find something about myself, something about him. I think if you look at these paintings, they probably look about as much like me as they do James Joyce. You know, prominent forehead, round glasses, prominent nose. He had thinner lips uh, than I do. Uh, but there's a certain amount of projection that, 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 that comes into anything that an artist is doing. Uh, and so I kept going back to him because he fascinated, I never understood him. I couldn't even get through his books. I probably read all the way through Ulysses, but it's not a book that is easy to read. It's not accessible. It's detailed in a way. And sometimes it's really just boring because you don't even know exactly what's going on. Uh, but the more you read it, the more you understand and the more profound it is and the more subtleties and illusions that there are. Is it like the unknowability of his fiction kind of was projected onto him as a character <laughs> so you would never get tired of it because you'd never really understand it? I think it so. It's like, a, a, yeah, it's like, a, you know, Boo Radley in To Kill a Mockingbird. You know, you continue to be fascinated by this character that you don't really know and understand. There's some mystery about him because I couldn't understand how his mind could work. I mean, this is a guy who was, you know, fluent in seven different languages. I he was there first, frankly. Barely, you know, getting one, you know. So in that way, he was like a rock star to me. Yeah. In that what do you plan to make with these, with these salmon? And his competence in what he was doing was, uh, was I could just have some slice of tomato. And, and, and every time I went back to him, I would find no new things. I would no do, potatoes. discover huh? new, new parts no. of it. Uh, 
Have any of you have probably heard of Joseph Campbell? Right? The, the mass of God. Well, Joseph we Campbell, the, the first book that he did, he was in, in 1927, he was in Paris, and somebody said, uh, okay. you should go buy this book, Ulysses. Paris was the only place you could buy it. It was banned in the rest of the world, but it really wasn't available in the United States until 1934. Because of all I'm, the court cases, it was obscene. I'm watching, not listening. I don't want language. To... He wrote about all the bodily functions and wanna... fluids that are involved with it, and nobody would publish it I'm because. Not... And there was a Supreme Court case. I'm not doing that. that. that I'm not. I don't want to feel uncomfortable. We have I'm watching it. And the freedom that we I'm have complaining. is because of the court case over the book Ulysses, where the judge never seen finally like this said, before. "Well, it's not obscene." It has all these bad things in it, but in the context of the overall thing, well, that's life. That's what we all have. So all of those bad words and all of those bodily functions that we see in books today I mean, really are a result of the enthusiasm he shows for this particular author. Literature instead of uh, uh, obscenity. Um, anyway, Joseph Campbell, the first book that he ever wrote was called A Skeleton Key to Finnegan's Wake. And Finnegan's Wake was the book, this is the book that was published in 1939, it took him 17 years to write. And Joseph Campbell was the person who taught everybody how to do it. There are a series of characters in it that are, it's coded in a way so that if you know what the code is, you can understand the book. But all of Joseph Campbell and the masks of God come as a result of his studies of, of James Joyce. This group of things over here, the sculptures, uh, first of all, this is, uh, this is the actual copy of Ulysses that I have taken all of the pages, cut off the binding, soaked all the pages in Mod Podge and then formed it into a boat. And rather than making a big boat like Ulysses might have had in Homer, I decided to make a little rowboat, the kind of boat that uh, Leopold Bloom and Molly might have used. So it that was my- uh, Above almost everybody uh, in the audience. And then I started making then one of the things that happens in, in Finnegan's Wake is that there is a writer character. Yeah, we talk about Homer. He's talking about he's, uh, the dark prince. He's, the, he's a, it's a pair of twins. This is this is Sean the postman. And this is Shem the pendant, and they are twins. And he uh, he he writes the word. He delivers the word. He's the light winning force. He's the dark force, and he lives in a place called the Haunted Ink Bar, is the name of his house where he lives in. And so I became fascinated with the characters that uh, are in Finnegan's Way and decided to make masks of all the members of the family. The father is Humphrey Chimpton Earwicker. The mother is Anna Olivia Plurivel, the two sons, Shem and Sean, and then there's a daughter named Izzy, and Izzy is, is a perceptual twin. She, all, she is only, she carries around a mirror with her all the time, so she has a mirror, so there's really only one girl, but she's always represented with her reflection, so it makes her a twin. So this is the, and, and these, uh, these streams of letters, one of the fascinating things about Joyce's work is he did a whole series of hundred letter words that stood for the sound of thunder. When God wanted, was angry or wanted to reveal something new to people, that was the sound of thunder. And the thunder was represented by a series of 100 word, uh, 100 letter words. And so I have made, if you read them left to right, each of them have their own 100 letter word that I wrapped around them. Um, 
And uh, there's 10 of them in that book. I think I've got five of them here. Were these words that you made up or these are words from the book? These are words from the book. I strung together. I looked up all the words in Finnegan's Wake and these are the actual words. So if you strung it out, you could find that word inside the book. Let me ask you another question yeah. about the material. So yeah. These materials we are familiar with. Yeah. You can figure that out of the, of the drawing. Yeah. But can you describe like what are some of the actual materials like these frames? What are they? Yeah. Okay, these are these are cradled frames that uh, I, I you know I got all of this stuff from Amazon. God bless China. This is where I get all of my stuff, uh, and I manage I, I because I do a lot of houses and a lot of this craft stuff. I stocked up before COVID. I had boxes and boxes. So you might say that this is a symptom of COVID for me. Uh, and what it's a frame. And what I've done is I've ordered from Melissa and Doug children's blocks uh, that I've gotten. And then I put the blocks and glued them into the frame. And then I ordered these little, these are used by architects to make little models of them. And put, uh, these all have some sort of symbolic reference that might be appearing with this character in Finnegan's way. And Joyce is also very interested in numerology. The, the numbers that he uses in it are, are very specific. Uh, the the all-knowing, all-encompassing father, HCE, as he is known. Well, he, the number that stands for him is 1132. 1132, really? What is, what is that? 11 is this, the number of renewal, the 10 fingers. The next one is 11. So that stands for a renewal. And 32 stands for the fall of man because gravity pulls things at 32 feet per second per second. So this is gravity. Gravity and renewal are his. And because woman comes out of man, half of that is 566. So each of these little numbers here have some very specific uh, reason why he's done it. And also, each of these characters, because they mutate and evolve through the book. Why can why is there only an hour? This is every mother that ever lived. This is not a, is that all you can give you. Lived. She also is a river, and she's all the rivers. This is uh, shells that are here, lapis lazuli I've used, uh, shells for the eyebrows, oh. um, and uh, when you have you get the chapter about Anne Lydia there's like a, a thousand different rivers that are named, and sometimes they're used as puns. Uh, but she's the river in it, and he's and the river eventually runs down, and at the end runs into him who is either the city or the ocean. So they come together, and, and she's. It, it all evolves out of him in some way. Let me ask you another question. Yeah. So there's obviously a lot going on. And yeah. Everybody will be able to come up close. Yeah. And I'll bring the, the computer up close so you can see it after two. But when did you make those masks? I really made these masks since we talked. These are, these were made since November. Uh, and I work quickly when I become obsessed with something. I do it a lot, uh, and and these are part of that same thing. This uh, this is the text of Finnegan's Way, six hundred and twenty eight pages, which means three hundred and fourteen sheets. I've now taken each sheet, coated it with, soaked it in Mod Podge, and then put in those little silicone uh, molds that you use to make caramels. And then I have baked that for about a half hour. You can just uh, you look at what it is all made of. 
So it's just, it's a, it's a little James Joyce Lego that I made. <laughs> and I, uh, so I, 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 I baked this and it has this nice green to it because of the, of the uh, blue on it. Um, this is a rosary made of Connemara marble from Ireland. The woman, what do you want? Um, charms that I have the tree of life. There's uh, the Eiffel Tower because Joyce lived in Paris for a while. Uh, there's a uh, multiple uh, uh, characters. With your um, I kind of use this as my. This is what a an ink bottle was. This is a giant ink bottle. Is what it is, and this is the haunted ink bottle, the jumbo version of it. And uh, I had a few bricks left over, and so I made a portrait of Shem. This is Shem. That Shem at some point uh, is is punished by putting being put in his own house having all of his paper taken away and his ink. And so what he does is that he <laughs> uses his own bodily fluids and excrement as ink and tattoos his entire body using it as paper. And so this represents, you can see the kind of little letters on it. He's a, he's a, he's a dark character. And you can see the details from and that sort of a, a, a shadow character. And the other, uh, the other one I made from this, this is uh, one of the themes of it is also the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve. These two stand for Adam and Eve. And so there's, uh, there's Adam right here. This is Eve right here. There's a writing desk. Here's a little, um, uh, 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 altar. A little altar here, an eating table where they are there. And then it's uh, the Garden of Eden is in Ireland. So it's orange and it's the colors of the Irish flag. So this is, uh, and, and that's a, the ongoing thing. What happened in the garden? Well, ate the fucking the apple. Uh, so this is another one. Well, wonder what happened to the God, Adam in the Garden of Eden. I said, he ate the apple. Um, Carl, I think we have that time. Why don't you talk about one more work, and then we might have some questions yeah. people have. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I, then I did a, 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 one of the themes is the ongoing houses. This has almost all of my major paintings. And this is my MoMA of Joyce that I've made. That I put on, um, and then I made a rock church for uh, him. Uh, and this is Joyce as a musician, so I've given him kind of a bird's beak, uh, and then all the musical instruments around it. And this is a kind of family used, used uh, photographs of the Joyce family. So it's him and Giorgio and Nora and Lucia that are on this. So this is the, the family chapel, I guess you would say. Family album as a house, something like that. Uh, what's your plan? So, so if you're ever lucky enough to go to Carl's house, um, there are bookcases all over the place, like any liberal uh, literature has. Yeah. There are, unfortunately, there are, those books are hiding because right. it's all been taken over by yeah. artwork ceiling to floor. Right. You have been working a lot for a, a long time. Yeah. So you're really surrounded by all of these works. Yeah. And what, start, do you, what, is, what do you want to do with that? Well, I started, it was, about, uh, it, it was about 2016, the fall of 2016. And it was after I'd gone to a Red Groom show and had been one of the 600 people that had gone to the famous 24-hour show of Taylor Mack. Uh, if you know who he is, 
uh, incredibly inspiring person, had amazing kinds of costumes. Anyway, the first thing I started to do was that I made a little castle for my granddaughter, Mallory, uh, and it was going to be a Hello Kitty castle. So I got the castle and I painted it pink and I shot Hello Kitties from all over the world, hard to find kind of Hello Kitties, not just the ones that you can find online. I had to send away to China and Korea to be able to find the Hello Kitties. And once I started making the houses, I realized oh, I, I like this. These are all basically bird houses. That's what these are. I got them from, I bought most of the, of the, of the houses I bought from Michael's. Uh, and so I started making the houses and now I have about 350 houses. And I do them in series, I do them in colors, I do some of them as blotches, some of them are covered, covered like this with rocks and paraphernalia, and lots and lots of little people, each one having its own little theme. So if Joyce is one of the themes, what are some of the other thing, themes in your work? Because this is just a slice. This is, right, the Joyce is only about 10% of my work. And it, a lot of it has to do with, uh, you know, color schemes. I'm going to work in blues this week. And so I'll make five houses that have to do with blue. And I'll use blue walks and blue paint and blue people on it. There'll be color themes in it. And I'm probably, the, I think I'm probably the only Mormon who has their own personal visitor center. I created a visitor center that has a, a, a Angel Moroni with the golden. He's about this tall, and but I made it a whole. Um, it's like a diorama. It's a diorama yeah. that has the Mormon story. It tells the story of the Book of Mormon using small little figures that I, there's a, a company that makes Book of Mormon figures, uh, go figure, uh, but it's not done uh, officially by the church, but I have, you know, from the beginning of Lehi and Nephi on through uh, the, you know, the golden plates being in there, and the angel appearing, Samuel the Lamanite up on the uh, the uh, mount preaching to the people uh so you have politics uh there's some political work i have political works well i you know i have a, a giant uh, head of brezhnev he's, he's more out of uh, this series uh but i but i have political things i i did uh two covid communities communities that were all in red and white that uh, were communities that showed the spread of COVID. And I also made a giant diorama of family photo day at the White House under the trunks. So there's zombies and all <laughs> sorts of little, I made this for Halloween. I guess it must have been, uh, must have been the, ha the first Halloween after the election. So it has, uh, you know, gold bugs in it, zombies in it, and, you know, werewolves in it, and seven different uh, President Trumps that all look alike based on the idea that when Saddam Hussein was like, one of the ways he wanted to keep secure was that he kept a whole bunch of lookalikes around him so that if someone wanted to kill him, they didn't know which one was the real one. So uh, this and the, the Trump piece probably has about 300 people in it. And there's a little uh, a little cottage where Putin is invited to stay. That is one of the little uh, doll houses. What do you call those little uh, the, the, the little um, houses that come up, the egg parts that come apart, little Russian houses. I can't remember what that was. Oh, the nesting eggs. Nesting, nesting eggs, eggs, right. Yeah. Nesting eggs, right. So no, nesting no. eggs for, for Putin's uh, little guest house mm -hmm. there. Uh, um, let's, see, let's see if we have yeah. some questions. Yeah. Okay, so, um, so what questions do you all have that you want to? So do you think that you'll ever 
take all these great stories. This would be a, a fantastic book in just your philosophy on great stories alone with photographs and your, your the beautiful uh, allegory, the story you're telling over here with these arts, you know, just to photograph all the food. Well, there is, I do have the idea to do a graphic novel of James Joyce. I think I have enough art to be able to do it. And I've done enough experimental writing. But when I started doing this in, uh, you know, in the 80s, there really weren't graphic novels. I mean, there were occasional ones, but, you know, now we have, you know, Art Spiegelman doing a graphic novel who's won a Pulitzer Prize. So it's a, a, a more common thing. And yes, I have the stuff to be able to make a graphic novel, I believe. And uh, it needs to be designed and put together. But I have, uh, I have made some like 50 page Xerox versions of it that then I could add all the rest into this to design and put use templates uh, on a computer to do it. So yes, that is an aspiration to do that with this particular thing. And I think I probably have enough stuff to be able to do it. It's a whole other world though. Would you do a straight biography or would you do a Joyce biography? I think I would do a Joyce biography <laughs> in that it gives me a huge amount of freedom. I don't have to you know, pay attention to the real facts. I can get a fact and then just <laughs> improvise from there. Uh, One of the things that we're going to do with this mm -hmm. thing tonight is we're recording this uh, the Zoom part. We're going to put it on YouTube, which will be yeah. fun for people to see. Yeah. But if somebody wants to get in contact with you, how would they do that? Uh, I have cards that I can give people. Do you uh, mind giving your email? Or and like and my email or is Carl Arrington, one word, C-A-R-L-A-R-R-I-N-G-T-O-N at gmail.com. And you're on, do you post some of these images? And I on post, Facebook? I have a, 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 I have an Instagram. That is Arrington Carl, one word, where they can find it. And I'm also on Facebook, and I put art on that as well. And I've even finally given in and started putting things on Twitter now. <laughs> so I'm putting uh, the occasional Joyce on Twitter. So I do have social platforms that I put different stuff on that I've either just finished or I'm particularly interested, or it might be celebrating some holiday. Any other questions? You have a website? Okay. I don't have I don't have a web I, I actually do have a haunted ink bottle website that I own the name of but I haven't ever made the website because I haven't just got to do it okay I'm too busy you got distracted this, this kind of swept into my life I didn't really when I when I called up Glenn and said hey why don't I bring some of my little Joyce things down and have a little show none of this really existed in November. And it gave me a kind of, well, you know, you lock a person up with a bunch of crafting goods and uh, the inability to go out and go to plays and spend time otherwise. Well, this is what happens. This is what you get if you do that to a person. So I'm, I am very prolific. Once I get going on something, I, it's like a, it's like a, a self-imposed deadline. That means, and these these have all been done since the end of the year. So what, what is this, February 6th? So this, this is in the last month, all of these came. This one was the first one that I did. Then I got, I was going to make some masks for Mallory and Arthur, my grandchildren, for Christmas. But then I couldn't go see them because of COVID. I, they live in Fairfield, Connecticut. So I wasn't able to go see him. So I just started playing around. And the first one that I did was the Shem. And I thought, well, oh, this is kind of interesting. It's a writer, and it's got some little houses that I got from China. And I thought that was interesting. And I thought, well, let's, why don't we make a pair of twins? So I made his brother, Sean. And I thought, well, if you're going to have the two twins, you might as well have the parents. <laughs> and each layer, uh, it, it became more complex and more interesting to me as I thought of things. You know, the hundred letter words came to me later. Well, how do you how are you going to put all of that stuff together? So it's a it's a it's a surge of creativity that comes along that is kind of disruptive 
to my life. I mean, there are some times where I cannot go to sleep because I've thought of a design idea and it just keeps me awake all night until I finally just get up at six o'clock in the morning and get my hot glue and my paints and start working on it. That's just the way that it happens. And one of the things that I love when I'm writing, time goes slow. Writing is hard. Writing is words. You have to be paying attention. You have to be hitting the keys. When I go into the art zone, it's a completely different experience. It's timeless. I can go with that. I can go for seven hours, you know, gluing this on and realize, I, hey, I haven't had anything to eat all day. And I really look up and I just realize, whoa, where, where have I been? You know, what I've been is in whatever this world is. Now I need to have a little, uh, a little character here. Uh, it, 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 there is a kind of, uh, it's very inspirational to me. And I don't know what it is, the right brain or whatever. Um, and it's fun. It takes me, it's a, it's a form of meditation to me. And one of the things that I've tried to do throughout the uh, COVID pandemic, tried to do something creative every single day. For a while, I bought a whole bunch of uh, uh, two inch wood cubes. And so I've done very tiny little designs and got about uh, maybe 60 of these little six cubes. And I've made a surrealist game so that you can choose different uh, combinations to put the six. There's 15 million different combinations. If you have 16 six-sided cubes, there's 15 million different combinations that you can use. So it's like the uh, exquisite corpse that they had as a surrealist game where the different combinations, depending on what you, it's kind of like a dream idea of where you can play this little game and there are eyes on there and nose, you can make faces, there are little cities on there, different color combinations. So you can create your own dream world. Well, this has been so amazing. I'm all the people here, please join me for the Uh, show some of the artwork around. Right. You might want to come up close and look at things or, of course, chat with him. Thanks so much for coming here, everybody. It's really a pleasure to see you all. Thank you. Thank you. Are we on? No. I'm oh, gonna, oh, I'm you're going to go. I have to show things. Ah. Up close and personal. So, Carl, is yes. a recording of a voice Oh, uh, let's see. There are some recordings of him reading parts of uh, Finnegan's Way. And I don't know whether we have him singing or not. Glenn, do you know? I don't think we do. I mean, he, he died in, in 1941, right before recording. And, you know, the last years, again, he was blind. He didn't have any teeth. So I don't think that he was really in shape to you. The, the yeah, yeah, in terms of it. It would be great. Uh, I mean, he's supposedly had a beautiful tenor. Yeah, it would be great uh, inspiration while you're doing that. Yeah. 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 